This is Thunder Cave, chapter 19. The fires burned down and the lanterns were put out, throwing the camp into semi-darkness. One by one, the men wandered off to sleep, leaving only the sound of flies buzzing and men snoring. The two Maasai stood like statues on either side of me, looking straight ahead. I tried to loosen the ropes with my numb arms, but it was hopeless. I wondered if Sapit had found the cave. I tapped out the cadence of Satanic's drumbeat on my foot. I wondered if I would ever see Sapit again. If it rained before I die, I'd know that I, he had made it. I'd been given a second chance at life, but I had wasted it by being rash. Your dad's pretty damn stubborn, like father like son, I thought. My chin kept dropping to my chest. Each time this happened, I snapped my head back up and forced my eyes open. I was determined to stay awake until the end. I had very little time, and I wasn't going to spend it sleeping. As the night wore on, I dozed more often, and my chin stayed on my chest for longer periods. Wake up, Jake, wake up. I snapped my head up and tried to shake the sleep away. I looked around though through blurry eyes and thought that I saw something or someone move on the other side of the camp. But when I blinked and looked again, I saw nothing. My chin dropped to my chest. The next time I lifted my head, I saw Sapit standing in the dim light of the closest fire. I almost shouted but caught myself. I held my breath and using just my eyes, glanced at the two Maasai on either side of me. To my amazement, they had not changed positions. Their eyes were wide open, staring straight ahead at Sapit. But they couldn't see him because he had camouflaged his body. Sapit stood frozen with one foot poised above the ground. He held his spear horizontally in his right hand, straight out from his side. If I could see him, why couldn't they? It wasn't possible. Then I realized what was happening. The guards were standing 10 feet away on either side of me. Their eyes were four feet above mine. And they saw what I saw at a slightly different angle. I could see a small part of the spear shaft, but from where the Maasai stood, they must have seen only the tip of the spear point, which was like looking straight at the edge of a razor blade. In other words, they couldn't see the spear at all. As Sapit made his approach, he wasn't thinking about what he was seeing. He was thinking about what the Maasai were seeing. In his mind, he stood with them, watching himself approach and moving accordingly. <clears throat> he used the shadows and background to camouflage himself perfectly. In effect, he was invisible. Enthralled, I watched as he inched his way towards us. The only way I knew he was actually moving was to recall his last position. Why he had decided to come at us straight on rather than from behind, I didn't know. Perhaps he thought the effect would be much greater if he ap appeared in front of the young warriors suddenly. It took him a long time while, I'm sorry, it took him a long while to work his way forward and I began to worry about the time. Sapit was incredible, but he never be able to do this in daylight. When he was 10 feet away, he stood perfectly still. I watched his rib cage. He barely breathed. The warriors continued to look straight ahead, totally oblivious to his presence. Finally, he took a regular step forward and swung his spear in front of him. I looked at the morons. They stood with their mouths open flabbergasted, too shocked to speak. To them, it must have looked like Sapit appeared from out of thin air. The Maasai to my right very carefully and quietly placed his spear on the ground. The other Maasai looked at him and did the same. Sapit motioned for them to step forward. They hesitated, then walked up to him and blow, bowed their heads. Sapit leaned forward and whispered something to them. They nodded, picked up their spears, and quietly walked out of the camp. Sapit grinned and walked over to me. I was about to say something, but he motioned for me to be quiet by putting his finger to his lips. He squatted next to me and cut the ropes with his knife. I had trouble moving my arms. He leaned close to my ear and whispered, Like I taught you. 
I knew what he meant. I pulled my tennis shoes off. We walked out of the camp very slowly, but not nearly as slowly as, slowly as Sapete had come into it. When we got to the trucks, Sapete retrieved his shuka and put it on. Just as we were leaving the camp, an armed poacher suddenly stepped in front of us. He was momentarily confused. Before he could figure out what was happening, Sapit swung his spear and knocked the rifle from his hand. The man drove, dove for the rifle, but when he turned around with it, Sapit ran the blade of his spear into his chest. The man screamed, but the sound died quietly. I stood in shock, looking at the blood pumping out of the open wound. Come, Sapit said urgently, pulling me. This man's scream had awakened the camp, and the, night, and the still night was shattered by shouts of alarm. We must go, Sapit said. There is a time to move slowly and a time to move quickly. He began to run down the street path, and I followed. By the time we reached the escarpment road, I heard the engines of the poacher's trucks. I glanced back up the hill and saw several spotlights cutting through the dark night. We started running east through the open bush. The moon was nearly full, making it relatively easy to avoid bushes and trees. I looked back and saw that the trucks and jeeps had reached this escarpment road. Some of them turned right, some turned left, and others headed overland directly towards us. There was no way we'd be able to outrun them. We must keep going, Sapit said. I know a good place to hide, at least for a little while. He led me to a large kopji climb he said we scrambled up and between huge boulders at the top the pete said this way i followed him over to the narrow crevice between two boulders he squeezed through and i was right behind him once through the opening the space got bigger we both leaned against the cool rocks and caught our breath there was just enough moonlight shining in to illuminate us for the third time, Sapit had saved my life. It was like he was my guardian angel or something, and I was keeping him a lot busier than I wanted to. I shouldn't have gone after those elephants, I said. He looked at me. No, he said. That was a mistake. It's just that I didn't want to see the elephants get killed. I couldn't stand by without doing anything. You did what you felt you had to do, he said. You cannot make good decisions without making bad decisions. Life is made of opposites. The next time you try to save the elephants, you will do it more effectively. Although I noticed that the elephants did get away. You were there? Close enough to see, he said. Was that flat tire a coincidence? No, I said, and told him about the thorns. He smiled and sat down on the ground. For the first time since I'd met him, he looked tired. The stalk and run must have taken everything out of him. Why did the warriors walk away? <clears throat> they left out of fear and respect. My sudden appearance frightened them, and because I wear this necklace, they thought I was satanic. What did you tell them? I told them to go back to their cattle and people and to never work for the poachers again. I heard a truck pull up and stop near the Kopji. A beam of light swept past our hiding place. Then the truck drove away. We will wait here until they come back past us, Pete said. Then we will leave. In the morning, they may send trackers out looking for you. In the daylight, it will not take them long to find this place. I don't think they'll waste their time, I said. The only reason they didn't kill me right away was so I could see the elephants slaughtered. You underestimate them, Sapit said. They are very clever men, and I don't think they kept you alive to see the elephants die. Evil is smart. Never forget this. You were spared for a reason, but I don't know what it is. I'm going to sleep now, he said. When the truck passes again, wake me and we will leave. I wanted to ask him where we were going to go, but he was already staring, starting to lie down. He was halfway to the ground when he froze. At first, I didn't know what was happening. <clears throat> I followed his gaze and saw the dim outline of a very large snake. The snake raised his head and stopped just inches from Sapit's face, then spread its enormous hood. A cobra! 
the snake hissed loudly and shot a glob of something into Sapit's face. Yelling in agony, Sapit rolled to the side. Without thinking, I grabbed his spear and swung it at the snake. The spear's sharp blade sliced through its body easily, and the two parts withered for a few moments before lying still. Sapit held his face in his hand. What is it, Sapit? I yelled. What can I do? A cobra, he said in anguish. A spitting cobra. My eyes. Stay away from it. I killed it, I said, putting my arms around him. What can I do? Through clenched teeth, he said, pour water into my eyes. Hurriedly, I grabbed the water gourd and removed the stopper. I put his head to my lap. I'm ready, I said. I took his hands away and from his face and with great difficulty opened his eyes and kept them open as I poured water. That's enough, he said, closing his eyes and sitting up. Let me have your shirt. I pulled it off as he carefully wiped his eyes with it. When he was finished, he handed it back to me and sat there for a few moments, then turned to me. Pour more water, I did as he asked. He blinked his eyes and said, I am blind. Blind? I couldn't believe it. I have to get you to a hospital, I said. Sapit smiled grimly. We're a long way from a hospital, Jake. The blindness may not last. It depends on the amount of the damage. I will know in a few days, and it would take that long to get to a hospital. What are we going to do? We will wait until the poachers head back to their camp, then you will leave. What do you mean I will leave? What about you? You must escape, he said. I will only slow you down. Find your father. I will be fine here. I'm not leaving you. You must, like hell. There was no way that I was going to leave him on this kopchi. What about the cave and the rain ceremony? He was silent for a few moments. I'm afraid, he said sadly, that I will miss the full moon, perhaps another time. Satanic said that this has to happen during the full moon, and I'm going to get you to that cave. But your father, my father doesn't even know I'm here, I said. When we first met, you said that I might be here for another reason besides finding my father. I know what that reason is now. It will be difficult with the blind man. You said that the journeys of all young men are difficult. Sapit smiled. I think I'll rest now, he said. Do you see any more snakes? <clears throat> I hadn't even thought about other snakes. Some guardian angel I'd make. I took his spear and poked around in some of the darker areas. I think it's clear. Good, he said, lying down. Wake me before it's light.